Okay. Uh, how about closure? Okay, that's that's heartening to know. Actually, okay. So uh, basically, this talk is about uh, Ohm. Ohm is a, a kind of a library or a framework, so to speak, for building user interfaces in volume. How about now? Slightly better. Okay. Okay, so Ohm is a closure script library that is, uh, you know, used for writing user interfaces and applications in the uh, for the browser. Uh, so, just a little bit about me. I work for this company called Tarka Labs. Uh, we are a consulting company. We are also looking for a product. Uh, I mostly work with, or I like to work with Closure, Ruby, and JavaScript mostly. But I also have to work with Java sometimes that being mainstream and all. Uh, so just a little bit of word about closure script. Closure script is uh, closure getting compiled down to JavaScript. Um, so it uses a piece of technology called the Google closure compiler. It has nothing to do with the J thing. It's the closure compiler. And closure compiler is pretty much used in every single uglification or minification thing that we have used before. So it's a very high performance thing it, it does a lot of optimization on your JavaScript code and then you know renders out code that can never be understood by humans actually. So it's so basically so you, once you write a closure code that basically uh, you know you goes through the Google closure compiler and becomes JavaScript and then it's used in the browser. So there's this thing called React JS. So how many of you have done web application development with frameworks and all that. Okay, good. That's, that's good. So ReactJS is a view library. It is not a framework. Uh, it was built by uh, guys in Facebook and Instagram. And it has a com very different take on how you build web applications. And we'll get to that a little bit. And uh, Ohm is basically a wrapper on top of uh, this React library. There are multiple wrappers actually. There is Reagent, there is Quiescent, uh, and there are more I'm sure there are more going to come up because uh, it's a pretty uh, good library and uh, you know I'm sure things can be more simplified and made better. Uh, so first off, I mean if you are from Angular or Emberland, React is not a MVC framework. It is just a view library uh, and one of its claim to fame that is that it's fast. And the reason it's fast is that I mean it, it actually treats your uh, view as a as a function of your the state of the data, and it does some interesting things like DOM diffing and virtual DOM and all that. We'll get to that very shortly. So, just a little bit of word about uh, you know uh, the problem with the web. I mean, the problem that most of these frameworks try to solve, right? Most of these frameworks try try to solve a problem where once you have the model and then you have your views, and then it's basically you have to decide when do you update the view when the model changes actually right and angular says okay you can have watches actually and then you have multiple types of watches you have a generic watcher and you have the you know collection watcher and so on and so forth you have various levels and in ember it says that okay you can have key value observables and then the way you change your model is always through a get or a set statement and you can then have computed properties and then you could declare that this depends on this particular property or one of the, uh, you know, some special syntax, like if it's a collection, then you say you watch every item in the property and then whenever something changes, then trigger this function, so on and so forth, right? So, but React takes a different view. Now, in React, there is this, uh, everything is a component, so this is like a DOM tree. So you have, I mean, so if you have a component A, which then composes component B, which composes C, D, and E, then uh, React, solution to this is that whenever you want to change something just do a set state on some component and then we'll render that component on all the children of the component below right imagine the good old days where you just had asp pages or php pages and then you change something in the model hit refresh and the whole thing gets changed i mean it's not very far from that and it would be just that bad uh, or like i mean for example with backbone and ejs where you just do a uh, you know this dot render and take the whole template out uh, but it, it would be that bad, except that uh, React has something called as virtual DOM. So as it turns out, JavaScript is fast, 
actually. So the slowest part of JavaScript is actually affecting the changes onto the DOM, right? So what React does is that it keeps a version of DOM in memory, okay? And then it makes changes, uh, and then after you set state or whenever it needs to repaint, it will basically construct uh, the tree from that point on where you said set state. And then it's going to have these two trees. Then it's going to do the diff of those two trees and then only play these. So here in this example, we start off with, uh, you know, div, uh, which just has one element. And then you have two elements. So, I mean, it, you can see how it plays out. So the first thing it says that, okay, for the first element, replace the text content to second. And then it says, okay, insert a node called first after that. Ideally speaking, it should, it should have just done insert of this thing, but I'll come to that. There is this concept of key in React views that you can use. But, I mean, this is, this fairly illustrates point on how React does the DOM decision. Right. But then, if you have a large set of components, then your thing is like, okay, it's going to do all this work. It's fast, but it doesn't have to do all this work. Right? So React provides a shortcut and it says, okay, you could also do should component update. There's this function that you can write where you as a programmer who implements this component can look at your data structure that you have and then decide whether the component should go for an update or not. So it doesn't need an update, then it doesn't even bother generating the virtual tree. Right? Now this gives an idea. So the problem with JavaScript is that they are mutable, right? All the collections or I mean like the objects, the arrays, any anything that you use in JavaScript is mutable. Right? So if you have to really know if one array equals to the other array, you cannot know unless you go through all the items in the collection and then say this is equal to that, actually. But if you have, uh, you know, uh, persistent data structures or immutable data structures, then you could clearly say as long as the reference equality is the same, then the objects are the same, which is awesome because Clojure has immutable data structures. It's one of the biggest deal about Clojure, apart from being a list, of course, right? So, Yeah, it, it, yeah, they, yeah, they are also based on the closures. I'm sorry, closure scripts in, in, uh, implementation of try. Not yet. They are not using it because um, I don't know if that's going to make it mainstream. The reason is because uh, people are comfortable using just objects and arrays and all those kind of things. So if you have to use immutable JS, that's a whole different learning curve that you have to go through to. No, uh, I mean, if you're using pure JavaScript, then it cannot be because you, you need, you need, I mean, you can't just turn a, a normal uh, data structure to an immutable data structure because the, I mean, the way in which you change or manipulate those data structures would be different, actually. But in Clojure, since they are built out of the box, it feels very natural to deal with them differently. So, th so this is a really great idea because uh, in OM, it actually implements should component, uh, update and it, it just does a reference equality check and if the reference equality check is the same, then it simply says, okay, don't, you don't have to update. Now this has one other side effect, right? Now earlier we remembered that you used to do set state and after you do set state, then it has to do that. Now that anyway this thing is there, the browsers have this feature called request animation frame. Does anybody know what a request animation frame is? Request animation frame is basically a callback that gets generated. I mean, approximately every 16 milliseconds to keep up for the 60 FPS kind of a display, smooth display. So what OM does is that it basically triggers a re-render of the entire view, every request animation frame, right, for the whole thing. And it's super fast because the persistent data structures, things don't change that frequently in apps. So essentially you, most times it's a no-op. There's, there's uh, you know, there's no DOM update. So, see, I mean, Closure Script actually makes React faster. So, with OM and all these things, OM out of the box is, you know, twice as fast as React with native JavaScript, even though it's built on a language which compiles down to JavaScript and it has, it has its own overhead. Right. So, I mean, you may be wondering, okay, so where is the code? So, I'm going to do some live coding and I'm not, I mean, I hate CSS, so it's going to be pure HTML thing. It's going to look ugly, but it's going to prove the, some of the points. So let's get there. So let me start my terminal. Let me change my 
Let me see if I can mirror my display. Let me also change my profiles. Okay. Okay, this is good. Can you all see it? Okay. So uh, those of you who know closure, I mean this line engine is the is one of the most popular things. So I'm using a template called own start. Uh, I mean the one that is available on uh, on closures right now is not up to date with the latest home versions and all that. I have a fork of it. I, they have he has merged my pull request, but he hasn't pushed it to closures. But hopefully by the end of today, it should be available on closures with the latest home version and all that. So I'm going to do the the thing that every single <laughs> and some some of the yeah, feel that I could raise a round of funding after building this. So so I'm going to create a to do application. So now I'm going to launch my editor. And before that, let me also go to the REPL. So it's trying to uh, it's trying to compile all my closure script files the first time to do this. So uh, this this kind of template has uh, has a server that is there and it also has a browser repel kind of connected to it and it also injects the browser repel into the statically generated file. It does a little bit of magic there, but it's pretty nice. So it, let me show you. So I start the server. Uh, I open up the browser repel and get to the closure script repel from the closure repel. And now I can visit localhost 3000 and gives me hello world. Okay, uh, and the nice part about it is now I can say world, and it's going to do that. So it's kind of like wired up now. Everything is working. Um, so let let me should quickly walk through the code. So I mean, apart from the standard project CLJA and all that. The only thing of worth anything is the core CLJS. So I have one uh, in the HTML file. Um, so let me see if, I mean, is this readable or should I increase the font size? Is this better? Some more? Okay. So here I just have one div ID app. Uh, I'm getting React and I'm getting the to do JS, and that's about it. Okay, so and in the uh, to do JS is basically this file which gets compiled down to JavaScript and gets executed. And here um, we have something called as an app state. So app state is basically a atom. Atom is a since a closure has a immutable data structures, it needs some sort of a reference type to point to immutable data structures. Say for example, if you want to change something. But you want this pointer to make sure that it's always pointing to some version of the immutable data structure, then that's what Atom does. So Clojure has multiple types, but as far as Clojure script is concerned, I mean, Atom is the only thing that's there, and that's the only thing that we need to bother with. Um, and once you have that, uh, Ohm defines something called as a root. Uh, so this is uh, similar to you know uh, React dot mount actually. So how you mount those components, and then here. Or you say React or render component is it's very similar to that, uh, and here what it expects is a function which returns uh, an instance of an object which has a render method. Actually, so so reify basically uh, takes a interface or enclosure. It's called a protocol. Here I render actually has only one method in it, which is the render method which we are setting up. The first argument to uh, a render method is always the this object which we don't care about. So we just put an underscore there. 
and all it does is we actually return a h1 and we actually say text of app. So here whatever this app and owner is there, so whatever we give an app state here is the one that goes as app here actually. Now here app state is defined as an atom uh, but by the time it comes here uh, when you when you use ohm root or when you use build or something like that, ohm actually converts it into something called as a cursor. Now cursor is very similar to a reference type, it's just that ohm uses it to manage the hierarchy of its properties and all that just to track when things change, what needs to update and so on and so forth. So okay, so now let's try changing this and see how what happens. So I'm going to say in an s uh, to do dot core and I'm going to change there and I'm going to say swap app state with So now the browser has this, the moment I execute this, so it's going to change this essentially. So the moment something in this app changes, the react, I mean since it's rendering on request animation frame, it's going to find that the value has changed and it's simply going to re-render it. So there is no set state done or nothing like that, it just keeps watching it and it changes. So that, and we haven't done any two-way data binding, none of those ickiness actually. So it is pretty nice and very clear. So now let's start building our to do app, right? And uh, the, uh, I mean, React basically says when you start building a React app or a React component, you should first build the user interface and then start extracting out functionality from that. So that's what we are going to do. So I'm going to take this function out and we're going to call it the app component. Okay. And it's still going to have this iRender method, of course, uh, but this is going to change. I'm going to say, we'll put it in a div, and in that div, we'll have a input element, um, which basically has, which is of type text, um, and let me give a placeholder, create a new item, so something like that, and just to make sure it's same, yes, so that takes a little bit of it, right, so we do this and then we close this guy out and say dom slash ul, again no properties. So when you do this first thing you give us properties and then you give the children of them. Uh, so, so here it has no attributes, it only has children, dom slash li, again no attributes and children is, uh, so we can say learn react. assuming we have something like that, right. So let's see if we haven't broken anything. So what I'm also going to do is I'm going to start off automatic compilation on the background for this. Okay, so this is basically going to watch the, uh, you know, changes on files and automatically keep compiling them. So the first time it starts out, it's slow, I mean, I'm, I've done some mistake. Yeah. So I don't think these match up. It should give us a green thing here, okay, done. So let's see what happens. And so you get this output. So let me close other tabs. So we get this, the placeholder is not coming actually though, right. So the reason why it is not coming is that here we gave it as a map here which is a, a closure script map 
but what uh, you know react expects that there should be javascript objects actually so the way in which you do javascript objects in closure script is that you have this thing called uh, you have a reader macro called hashjs once you put this hashjs in front of it it's going to turn that map into a javascript object and pass it to that so it's compiling now if you hit refresh and you have the placeholder as well available right okay so now what we have to do is then uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll figure out how to add items to this list so i just want to hit something and hit enter and then it should get added to the to the list so before that we'll turn this into a model in the back end so here we'll say again zeros and we'll add so we'll give a title for each one of them and we'll give uh, learn cjs So we have these things, and now we need to make sure that these basically render from here. So what we could do is we can do a map of dom slash li, no attributes again, and in this case now we have a colon title of that percentage, and we'll give um, the colon to dos of app. So app is what gets passed in. So we've got to dos of app, right? And then we will close this guy so I, I'm going to get all the ending parenthesis in one row it's a closure style and yeah, we have a lot of parentheses okay so so now now that we have this let's see what happens so let's see if this this is still building okay it says wrong number of args passed this rows Okay, what did I do wrong? I'm sure I I balanced something. Wrong. Oh yeah. So this thing needs to close here. And so we have one extra thing. So this should close the map. Okay, sounds good. So let's wait for it to compile. Done. Okay. Now it says zero three two three seven four six nine eight. So very helpful actually. So right. So the reason that ha it happens is that uh, I mean, if you notice uh, here, it accepts a path and then it just accepts this you know flat out like this. It doesn't expect it in a sequence here. So here map gives out a sequence actually. So in order to solve this, all you have to do is do an apply here. I mean, apply is very similar to the JavaScript apply. Where it kind of flattens out. I mean, if you have arguments in a list at the end, it just flattens it out into arguments in the center. So you save this. So let it compile. Finish compilation. So I have the advanced mode turned on because I wanted source maps and all that. Okay, so this works. So we haven't broken anything yet. So go moving on. So now we want a way in which um, for the input placeholder, yeah, yes. So even though this is all the code that we have right now, we are choosing ohm.core and ohm.dom, and then that depends on the React, and then you have like Google the things. I mean, so okay, just to give you a idea of the size of the file. So the this basically gets the Google thing, and then you have this whole bunch of things which are in here. It's just a pretty long file. I mean, it gets the basic Google thing and all that. So it gets the Google string, Google DOM, all the things that are required for us to work with, actually. So Google array. So there is a way for it. I mean, you can turn on advanced compilation flags to make this even slow. I mean, shorter. But that means your compilation will become slower. I've Simple as the optimization mode. Once you have optimization mode advanced, you reduce it further. Um, 
yeah, but I'm not happy with the the compilation speed myself. It has to be faster. Seven seconds every time is crazy. Uh, anyway, so now, uh, so what we'll do is when we hit enter, that's when we want to add it. So, so we'll use the on key down event. Now, even though these look like um, your DOM, normal DOM event, uh, these are React synthetic events actually. So React gives uh, kind of like, uh, you know, events which are cross browser compatible. So even like on change would be like on key up on something, it will be, uh, it'll be on blur on some other thing and so on and so forth. React kind of homogenizes the, uh, the these uh, event handlers as well. So that's one nice side effect of having a layer of functionality for us. So this is like the polyfill for all your DOM events. So you have on key down and on key down we'll call a function which will say handle new item and we will pass it the event which is the first argument and we'll also pass the app and the owner page. So and we'll write the function handle new item and that has event uh, and the uh, app and the owner. So we only need to bother about it when the uh, so when when the value of the event or rather the which of the event is actually the enter key which happens to be 13 right. So I mean if you have good programmers then you have to say def enter and make it def once rather. So only when it is enter we need to bother about it and what we need to do here is we need to uh, we need to find out what is that input element that we are dealing with. So to do that what I am going to do is I am going to do one more thing. I am going to create I mean react allows you to put a reference to some DOM node. So whatever component that you give here. So these are all synthetic components. DOM slash input is still a, a react defined uh, component actually which then wraps a normal HTML component. So here you can pass a ref to, I mean you can uh, indicate uh, any of these or rather I would say tag any of these components with the reference and then you can get the actual DOM node from them later, the wrapped wrap DOM node. So here I would say new input, sorry, new item input um, and then I will say input is ohm slash get node of owner which is the component that has it and the one that defines the ref, so new item input. So this will give me the DOM node which is, which is behind the scene. So now I can say item text is or item title is actually val, value of input, right, which is, it's just a DOM node so I can get a dot value on that field. Once I have that, all I have to do is I have to add it to the to do collection on top. So to do that, um, you, you can't directly do a swap anymore because that is the global variable and this is like an event handler within your component. So you can't leak uh, reference to the global variable. So the own app uh, thing that you see on top here is actually a ohm cursor actually. So ohm allows this thing called this the transact. So which is very similar to the swap function uh, which closure script gives. So what this does is it lets you reach to the app and then it also lets you reach to one of those nodes. It, you can give like a vector of keys that you want to get to. So here since it's just one level for us, I'm just going to do to do's. And for this to do's then you have to pass a function to say how do you want to modify it actually. So here we just want to simply conch uh, that with a new, uh, new uh, item which is going to be title of item item title. So we'll balance off the parenthesis and you got. So now that this is done, let's see what happens. Let's see if everything compiles for us. Okay. So far so good. And so we should be able to enter that. Something wrong. 
validarity one. Give me one second, I just want to know where it happens. Um, the app owner conch this. Oh, I'm sorry. Here it doesn't need. Uh, so I just need to conch the object directly. I don't know why I put the bracket. So the only thing is that the, the input is not getting cleared actually. So we'll have to do that. So let's do that. Wait for it to compile. Okay, now that's done. We should be able to refresh. Voila. So we have been, we can add to do's now, right? Now the next thing what we want to do is we want to mark, toggle something as whether it's complete or not, right? Then it's, that's the next thing. So to do that, what I'm going to do is instead of having uh, the DOM li created here, I want to turn this into its own component because yes. So I want, so we'll turn this into a into a React component or an own component actually. So let's do that. So here we can say defn item component. So this will have an item and an owner. And we'll reify uh, and then om slash i render. Om slash i render has one method called render, which taking this as an argument for which we don't care. And now this is going to have dom slash li. So what I'm also going to do is I'm just going to put a dom slash span within this and do that because I also want to support inline editing later so that I can put either this or the edit box if it's editing. So dom slash span and then I can say uh, no attributes to this and then title of item. So how do we then use this item component now? Pretty simple. So, so we have this guy. So this guy should go. Instead, we should use the item component. And instead of map, we'll use something called as build all. Actually, right? Um, of course, this is within ohm. So ohm slash build all. Actually. So what this does is basically it takes each one of these functions it then creates a object of that re i mean render uh, i mean the object which has the render method and then it then actually you know sets the uh, item that is here because since we are doing the to do's of app each one i mean it it's going to take it from that sequence on the collection and uh, for every item it's going to come here and it's going to display so let's see if this works So this, this works as well. So far so good. So this continues to work. That's nice. So now let's actually implement this thing. So whenever I double click on span, I want to mark this as complete. Okay. But even before that, I just wanted to show you one thing. So React comes with this awesome plugin here. So can I, yeah, nice. Awesome plugin here, which actually lets you expand this div, right? So this is our input, this is the UL. And within this UL, you have these unknown components, right? Within this, you have these props for each one of these unknown components. Here you see this key component, right? It's null. So rem remember we talked about the diff algorithm and it said that, okay, so if you add something in the beginning, then what it's going to do is it's going to replace the text of each one of those and then add one more node at the end. So which is not ideal thing, right? Because 
you just need to add one thing in the top or one thing in between. So to do that, React has this thing called the key, which it uses to track uh, the uniqueness of a node among its siblings. It's not like ID, which is, uh, you know, which has to be unique throughout the page, right? That, that's the problem with the HTML ID. But key simply has to be unique within the siblings of it. So it's actually pretty neat. So what we're going to do is we are going to generate that ID for us. So the way we can do it is, um, so remember I told you that uh, we use oh, we use Google Closure library is available to us, so we can do that. And so I'm going to import from the Google Closure library, Google.ui has a thing called ID generator. I'm going to use that and I'm going to have a GUID method which is going to get next to me ID of get instance of right so this is going to give us the unique ID. I mean, so for those of you who don't like this style, you can also do this. If it makes you feel any better. So both, this is called the threading macro. So I'm going to set the ID here. And similarly, when I create this item object, I'm going to also set a ID here, just so that we can keep track of it now. And yeah, so we have set, I mean, this is something that we call, it could be, you know, my ID or something like that. So it's just your, uh, it's just in your domain model, whatever you call it, that is that actually. But when you're doing it here, so the third, uh, so in the ohm build or ohm build all, it then takes an options hash, which actually says, which is the uh, value that I need to look up into this map that you give me for the ID value, for the key value. So he says, now we say, okay, for the react key or even for the ohm key, use the ID property of the map that I'm giving you as the, as the key. Now let's see if this works. It says seven seconds, but somehow feels more than seven seconds. Right, so let me go to React. Oh yeah. So now you see the key is set up here. It says colon zero, and then just colon one, colon two, and so on and so forth. So it will keep generating unique ID. Okay. So far so good. So we have created the unique ID and everything is set up. Now I want to support the double click here. So, I mean, I want to support the completion for which I'll use double click. So, the same way, this has to be a JS object on double click. And this needs to be a function. Um, so, I'll just use the event and the item. And so what I will do here is and I can do an ohm slash transact. Item and then I can say it. completed and this should be, uh, I mean whatever state it is, it should just toggle that. So it should be not of equal or So far so good. I'm sorry? Uh, no, it, it can't, right, because it's going to, uh, 
خاتم بھی کیا ریشن And here we'll set the class name and we'll set it to the class name. Okay. So most of the HTML properties should be the same except that a few of them like this. Um, since a for and class are uh, JavaScript reserved key keywords, so uh, I mean, it, I mean, I think they are the only two HTML attributes that are allied to class name and HTML for. So, but otherwise, all other HTML properties should just work like that. Right. So, this. Okay. So I'm going to double click on this and so set the style for this. And so double click again and it's fine. And that's fine. I'm sorry. Or something else. All right. So I mean, we are almost out of time. So if we start inline edit, then we won't have time for questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip that. If you are interested, you can always come. I'll be hanging around. You can always hack on it a little bit more. So this is what I had to show. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to take. No, right. Uh, so because that gets generated once, it's there in the, um, it's there in as a part of your domain model, right? So only when you create it, I'm just creating the GUID and it's, it's I'm putting it there, and that's about it. Yeah, if it if it if it, I mean, yeah. So when you choose a key, you have yeah. When you choose a key, you have to make sure that it is unique uh, among all this. Otherwise, it will be a problem for you. So I mean, usually if you are coming, I mean, if you are basically reading this object from a backend, I mean, you will have some identity of the object which the backend is going to give you, I mean, from a web service or something like that, from a RESTful, RESTful endpoint. You can simply use that ID instead of using this. Okay, so reify basically, um, so what closure script has, what 
disclosure has is that so you have these protocols so this comes from java land right so uh, so many times you would have to implement an object of a particular interface and then you'll say new this and then implement it directly right so what reify does is something similar to that so it says this is an object uh, which conforms to this protocol and this i render protocol has this one render method and that's about it so so reify basically gives you a object which satisfies this contract yeah yes 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 yeah dumb no, yeah, so there is a model in between if you actually notice, I mean we are binding on those models and we are getting those values and so on and so forth. Um, so even if you, okay, I just wanted to show you, I mean I'm just digressing a little bit, but I think it will be a good, um, I'm just going to quickly go to JSPIN and show you how React looks like for real, I mean how real React is. So I'm just going to add library React. And then I'm just going to do it. So, so this is like the pragma thing for React actually. So I'm going to give a give. So I'm just going to ID is equal to app. That's it. And then. So, um, yeah, I'm not helping, am I? I mean, I'm, I'm putting uh, code looks even smaller here. Yeah, I'll, I'll hide this, you know. Right. So I'm not making this any better for you. I'm just putting HTML, I mean, directly onto JavaScript thing. But it is not that bad because it is the same as doing this. Actually, so if you don't have this Re React JSX DOM, this won't work. Uh, so what this really is is react dot dot h1 of no values and it's just the same thing. So the way you deal with it in React and the way you deal with it in GNOME is not very different. But yeah, given that you have Angular and uh, you have uh, all this, I mean Ember or whatever, doing HTML bars, I mean sorry, handlebars and uh, you know angular templating and all that uh, sticking code sticking html and this kind of dom into your component seems a little kind of a you know a regressive step in in terms of this thing but uh, give, give it 5 minutes right I mean, give, I mean when i say give it 5 minutes it means that okay start, try building a small app in react you'll actually feel that see that uh, the components that you write will be the view layer actually so react also advocates something called as the flux a flux pattern where you have store and then you have events and then it goes in. With Ohm, you can do the similar kind of thing with core agents. Uh, unfortunately, 45 minutes is not enough to cover the architectural patterns behind Ohm. No, React is not based on request animation. React is a view library. So React basically deals with DOM diffing. It deals with, uh, you know, uh, then playing out these DOM differences. And it has the optional JSX component. And that's about it, actually. So everything else is something that you build on top. So with closure script, you have immutable data structures. And since we have immutable data structures, then we can we can go ahead and leverage request animation, animation uh, frame without any performance penalty, which simplifies our life as programmers uh, dealing with uh, complex user interfaces. Request animation frame, yes. Yeah, as far as Ohm is concerned, Ohm makes a choice of doing this on request animation frame. Uh, Quescent or reagent does not do that, actually. With Quescent or reagent, you then do set state, like how you do deal with React, and it's kind of simpler there, actually. 
So, but with Ohm, it, I mean, it almost feels magical that you just change the model and automatically something changes without paying performance penalties on that, right? Otherwise, it's essentially like redrawing the entire thing. But because the way in which Closure has immutable data structures and React has DOM diffing and these two work together very well, you have almost a magical feel to your thing where you just write UIs completely declarative on your app state. The moment you change your app state, everything just works. Actually, which is, which is, if you think of complex user interfaces, that's, that's kind of the holy grail. So you have several request animation frame pol polyfills that are available, actually. So that would still work. So you can do a set timeout and then you can just do it. So it still works. Yes. True. So I mean, wherever it is available, then if ES5 dirty check is available, it will use the dirty check. It doesn't have to be. I mean, like for example, since it has an immutable data structure, we are not dealing with JavaScript objects and JavaScript arrays. These are closure vectors and closure maps. They are immutable by default, actually. So you don't need dirty check. Just the reference equality is enough to find out whether they are same or different. I mean, there is. I mean, so you don't need two-way binding. So if you if you notice in our code. It is almost as if it, you are doing two-way binding, right? Um, so I mean, so if you have input, okay. So here in input we didn't we didn't do that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So here, uh, so we did on key, key change, right? So so let me do this. Um, let me see this. Uh, not so actually when you come to the edit mode uh, maybe we'll we, I, I'll show you how that works so you don't have to do two way two way data binding because here it's pretty much the, the the whole point of react or flux is to have a unidirectional data flow right so you have your model and any change in your model view is just a representation of the model any change you make in the view actually has to go through the cycle to get to the view it needs to raise an event it needs to change the model it needs to come back and then the view will get updated Right, and when and I say this change, I'm talking about the view model change. So whatever is the view model that is backing the view, that needs to change, and then the view would change, which is yes. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely, we need to put events. Yeah, but then you pay the cost in terms of watcher, right? I mean, so ha has anybody dealt with bind once here? Okay, you can ask them about the pain of why why bind once existed in the first place. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it's not to beat up on Angular. Angular is a good framework, but I mean, it it it, it comes to the cost actually. All that binding, two-way binding, comes to the cost. If you have no further questions, then we can call it a wrap. I'll be around so you can always feel free to catch me. Thanks, guys.